The Apostle Paul once wrote, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Too many people waste time dwelling on past hurts, past failures, or past disappointments. Too many people allow their emotions to run their mind rather than the other way around. We can't always choose what happens to us, but we can choose what we focus on. We can't stop all the hurt that will come into our lives, but we can choose how long we let that hurt live rent-free in our minds. We don't know what's around the corner, but we know the one who does. This is why Paul trusted God to lead him in the way of life. It's why Paul chose to focus on the upward call of God in his life. And note that Paul calls it the upward call of God. God doesn't want us to spiral down into depression or despair. God doesn't want us to wallow in pain or pity. Life will sometimes knock you down, but God wants to lift you up. And if we cooperate with God's work in us, He will lift us up. God's call will always move us upward and forward. It's the enemy who wants to take us backward and downward. We choose whether to follow God or follow the enemy. The truth is, God loves you. You are His creation. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you, He loves you, and He sent Jesus to die for you. And God has a plan and a purpose for you. We discover that plan as it unfolds one day at a time, when we love God, trust God, and obey God. Let God be your sustainer and your guide. He is your hope, and He knows your future. Trust Him as you move forward, not backward, in your life. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're joining us and that we can be together here at Treasure Lake Church, a community that finds itself at times spread out far and wide, and I'm very happy that we can connect this way. It is true that God has given us an upward call, and he's asked for us to lift our eyes and to seek the things that are above. He's asked us to put our thoughts on his kingdom and on his glory. He's asked us to think and to look forward to that great day when we will be with him forever and ever we have an upward calling. And in order to fulfill that calling, it requires us that we need to walk by faith and trust our Lord Jesus each and every day, that we listen to his spirit, we follow his leading. And today we want to pursue that upward calling together and we want to encourage each other to spur each other on as we pursue the upward calling of God. I'm looking forward to, the, to today and I'm looking forward to the way that we can praise our glorious Lord who has great things in store for us. As we go to the Lord in prayer, there are people that we want to be praying for. I'm really thankful to be able to say that Edie McCartney, is, uh, she had a good diagnosis from the doctor, and we're thankful for um, what he had to say to her. And we today are going to be praying for some people that we love and that we care about. We're going to be praying for Randy and Melanie Cole. It uh, does seem like it can rain and pour at the same time. So Randy's had uh, quite a little, few days in the hospital, and... The doctors are still trying to figure out exactly why um, he hasn't been feeling well, and we're going to ask that those answers come. At the same time, Melanie has been in the hospital with her father as well, who also had a procedure this Thursday. We want to pray for the Cole family that the Lord would strengthen them. We also want to pray for Mark Erickson and his family. Mark was up here just last week um, playing the guitar and leading us to the throne, and uh, on Thursday his wife, Dina, went to be with the Lord. And uh, Dina has, um, she was uh, sick for uh, quite a little while, and it is a glorious thing that she's in the presence of her father and that uh, all pain and suffering are gone away. But we want to pray for the encouragement of Mark and his family as they 
begin a, a life in which they will be, well, thinking of her often and missing her. So we're going to be praying for Mark Erickson's family and for Kevin Hollander's father, for Bonnie and for Manda. We want to pray for Deb Shannon that her back would, uh, would be well without any surgery or procedure. And let's take these prayer requests and others to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are glorious and that you have given us an upward call. We thank you that you have tilted our heads back and asked for us to look high and to see the things that are of you. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and we pray that our pursuit would be after this upward calling. And Jesus, we thank you that you empower us and that you take us to the upward calling. We thank you for progress that has been made, and, and Lord, as there are times that we also stumble and we uh, are moving backwards instead of forwards. We come to you and we say, Father God, forgive us for we sin. And it's something that we're very familiar with. And we thank you for the blood of Christ. We thank you for his gracious gift. We thank you for his grace. Father, we have people that we love and care about and we want to pray for Randy Cole. We pray that everything would be determined as to why he hasn't been feeling as well as he normally does and that you would heal him. We pray for Melanie as she is taking care of and thinking of Randy and her father at the same time. Bless her father and give him health and strength. Lord, we pray for Mark Erickson, and we ask that you would comfort him and the whole family. Thank you for a wonderful life that Dina lived and a life of service to so many people and of care. Thank you for what she modeled and how she inspired. Father God, we pray that you bless the Erickson family. We thank you that you have blessed the McCartneys. We thank you that Edie is uh, doing better. We thank you that you have heard our prayers. Father, we ask that you would heal Bonnie, that you would heal Manda, that you would take care of Jean Rue and some concern that he has with his leg. We pray, Father, that Jen Colop's voice would come back strong and she'd be able to articulate everything that she would like to say. We pray for Th Thaddeus' mom, Father, that you would, would heal her and we pray that you would take away and solve the pain that Michelle Wilkes has been going through. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you gave Dave Candelar a good surgery, and we pray that you would remove the blood clots that are now a concern. And Father God, we ask that you would keep us safe. There's all sorts of things that could come our way, and we pray that you would keep us safe from, from ailments and from diseases, from COVID. And Father God, keep us safe for also from, from mistakes that we make because we just weren't pursuing you. We weren't being obedient, and we would like to be obedient, Father. Lord, we pray that today as we worship you, today as we listen to your word, that we would draw close, that we would experience your presence, that we would meet with you. For Father God, you are great, and we thank you that we can come to you, that you hear our prayers, and that you even coach us forward on how we should pray. Heavenly Father, we love you very much, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior and Lord. Amen. Sits on heaven's mercy. 
Hey church family! So we'd like to remind all our camping crusaders of TLC Online. Get filled with the Word of God by experiencing church online. Go to treasurelakechurch.org anytime for this week's sermon. And hopefully the next time I see you, it'll be around the campfire. Saturday, June 19th, we'd love to see you at the city park. Together with Affirming Fire Ministries, we will be having a community outreach from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The hot dogs are free. We'll have clothes for those in need. It'll be a great time to meet new people and share the love of Christ. For more information, please call John Patricelli. In two weeks, we'll be back at New Providence Beach for our grand TLC picnic. Bring the whole family and splash around with the kids and grandkids. We'll provide the meat and drinks. Please bring your favorite side to share. This month, we continue to collect pledge cards for the new Welcome Center. You can drop off your cards in the offering plate at the entrance to the sanctuary. Please make this initiative part of your weekly prayers. Promise keepers, prepare. It's coming June 15th. We can prove to the world that Jesus is Messiah and they will believe that he has been sent of God. a better country, inhabited by better states, made up of better counties, composed of better cities, inhabited by better neighborhoods, influenced by better churches, made up of better families. We need a generation of better men. It starts with us today. We are about to come together to lift up Jesus and push back every vestige of darkness. As a young man, I went to Promise Keeper events. And here I am today, by the grace of God, encouraging you, inviting you to participate in much more than an event. It is a prophetic gathering that will mark you for life. If you have a son, bring your son. If you have a grandson, bring your grandson, your neighbor, your friend. Believer, non-believer, we're going to gather in Jesus' name. And we're about to do one thing together, change the world. Not everyone's going to be able to make it to Dallas, but we're going to make sure no one misses out. We'll be hosting the Promise Keepers event right here at TLC, June 15th and 16th. All of the great speakers and worship is going to be enjoyed right here in Dubois. So mark your calendar and sign up on our website. Together, let's be part of what God is doing in our nation. Let's do this. find this card in the view in front of you. Please fill it out and place it in the offering plate on your way out so that we can give you a true TLC welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great week. I've always been told how average I can be always been criticized about being average but I want to tell you something I stand here before you before all of these people not listening to those words but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars to be the best that I can be good enough isn't good enough if it can be better and better isn't good enough if it can be best that's when you hit rock bottom remember this while you're struggling, rock bottom can also be a great foundation on which to build and on which to grow. Person that gets up off the canvas and keeps growing, that's the person that will continue to grow their influence. This woman was the finest woman I'd ever seen in my life. We're at this dance and I find out her name is Trina Williams from Lompoc, California. And, and we were all dancing and we're, we're just, just excited. And I decide in the middle of dancing with her that I would ask her for a phone number. The next day we walked to Baskin and Robbins ice cream parlor. My friends couldn't believe it. This has been 40 years ago and my friends still can't believe it. We go on a second date and a third date and a fourth date. We go together for a year, two years, three years, four years. By now Trina's a senior in college. So now it's, it's, it's time to propose. We get married, we have a few children. 
Our lives are great. One day, Trina finds a lump in her left breast. Breast cancer. Six years after that diagnosis, me and my two little boys walked up to mommy's casket. And for two years, my heart didn't beat. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. If it wasn't for those two little boys, there would have been no reason for which to go on. I was completely lost. That was rock bottom. You know what sustained me? The wisdom of a third grade dropout. We're at the casket in College Station, Texas. I'd never seen my dad cry, but this time I saw my dad cry. That was his daughter. Trina was his daughter, not his daughter-in-law. And I'm right behind my father about to see her for the last time on this earth. And my father shared three words with me that changed my life right there at the casket. It would be the last lesson he would ever teach me. He said, son, just stand. Just stand. You keep standing. You keep standing. No matter how rough the sea, you keep standing. And I'm not talking about just water. You keep standing. No matter what you don't give up. I learned that lesson from a third grade dropout who was a cook at Cal Maritime. He said, boy, you keep standing. No matter what, you keep standing. No matter what you don't give up. 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 That's a wonderful video you just saw and it's got a great message. The title of today's message would be, You Are Special. It's a prayer of Paul's in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, all the way through verse 23. And it's just one sentence uh, in the Greek, but it kind of just runs on and on and on, because he's got, just like a guy that's excited, he's got a lot of things he wants to say, he doesn't even, you get the idea, he's not even going to take a breath, he's just going to keep on going. So I'd like to start out by telling you the story of a man named Victor. And he felt like he was a loser. He didn't do very well in school. And at the age of 16, a uh, teacher said to him, maybe you ought to just go out and get a job. Uh, that didn't go well either. By the age of 32, he had failed at 76 different jobs. And so somebody suggested you ought to go into the military. And he went and applied to be a part of the military. One of the things they required when he went into the military was he had to take an IQ test. When he finished the IQ test, he had scored 161. Now, 100 is average. 130 is genius. We really don't know what his IQ was because back then, the IQ test only went to 161. He well could have been up to where they nowadays would be 200, 200 plus. When he left that test, he realized something. Hey, I'm special. I'm special. Just, uh, you don't know Victor Sharenko, but he uh, went on to become a doctor and he developed the laser surgery technique that we use today, all because the test said he was special. God has some things to say about you, some tremendous things, because in his eyes, you and I are special. We'll take our Bibles and look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and it says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that your, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory and inheritance in his people. And this incomparable uh, great power for us who believe, the power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And every name that is uh, evoked, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and anointed him to be the head and over everything uh, for the church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I'd just like to mention that Paul's prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. I want you to notice he prayed for two things or thanked God for two things about us. First of all, he had heard about the Ephesians' faith in the Lord Jesus. That's where it all starts. Last week, Dave spoke on Ephesians chapter 1, uh, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and he talked about our faith that Christ had provided for us, that it wasn't because of anything we did, it was because of everything he did. When we come and we place our faith in Christ, what we're saying is we couldn't do it on our own. We were sinners. Uh, we were unable to save ourselves, and we had to depend upon his gracious gift of salvation and Paul was excited. I, I, you can tell Paul had the heart of a pastor. Nothing gets a pastor more excited in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening than to find someone has come to Christ or that they've been influential in leading to Christ or being a part of somebody's journey to Christ. And man, he was excited about all the people that were coming to Christ there at the church at Ephesus that he loved so very much. And then he said he had heard of their love for all the saints. He said, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And so he heard of their love for all the saints. Now, I tell you what, as a Christian, as a pastor, it would probably have been a little easier if he had said he had heard of their love for the saints. But when he put that word all in there, I want to just tell you from personal experience, not all Christians are easy to love. We don't get to choose who God brings into our life. But we choose, we make a choice to love all the saints. Uh, everybody ought to be welcomed. I, I've actually uh, pastored here for 16 years, and every once in a while somebody come into the church, and, and maybe they weren't dressed quite like us, or they didn't look quite like us, and, and a dear old saint would come and say, I don't know whether we should let them in our church. I'm here to tell you, the church is not a country club. It is a hospital. A hospital to reach those who have needs. And what Paul was thrilled about is they didn't have any classes in that church. They didn't have any division. There wasn't slave and free. There wasn't rich and poor. They loved one another for who they were. They had all different kinds of people in that church, just like every other church does. But uh, they loved all, all, all is the key word, the saints. Second thing he prayed about was for wisdom. And uh, it says here in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He prayed that uh, they would know him better. See, I'm convinced that in the church today, we don't need more programs. We don't need more materials. Man, you can turn on the radio. I traveled clear across the United States. And I was never out of reach on my radio of listening to gospel music or a pastor speak or some conference, spiritual conference. That our, 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 our way, airways are filled with uh, all kinds of knowledge and understanding but, and, and all kinds of uh, music and everything. The problem is not that we're not getting enough of the gospel. We're just not absorbing enough of the gospel. He said, I pray that uh, your hearts will be enlightened with wisdom and revelation that you might know him, know him. I, you know, it's, it's important that we as Christians just don't know about Christ, but we know Christ, that we have that intimate relationship. You're not gonna get that from just Sunday. You're not gonna get that from just reading a couple verses a day. Those are all important and you should be a part of your life but really, to get to know a person, you've got to spend time with that person. And that's why the Bible talks about meditation and encourages you to, to read the word and, and spend time with him so that you can know him. And out of knowing him, you will have revelation. I'm not necessarily talking about you'll know what's going to happen next week or what stocks to buy and that kind of thing. But you'll begin to understand what's going on in this world. And I think in this day and age, people are wanting to understand. The third thing that he prayed about was a prayer for enlightenment. A prayer for enlightenment. 
Perhaps you've heard of the uh, story that said this, or a little rhyme that says, he who thinks he knows what he does not know is a fool. Avoid him. He who does not know what he does not know is a child. Teach him. He who does not care that he does not know is lazy. Exhort him. He who knows that he knows is wise. Follow him. See, Paul speaks of a knowledge here. He knows that he knows, and he knows what he wants you to know. And he wants you to know three things. First of all, about your wealth. Your wealth is in the hope of his calling. A number of years ago, off the coast of Massachusetts, a ship rammed into a submarine. The submarine sank before anyone could escape. The entire crew was trapped. Ships rushed in from uh, all air, different directions to the scene of the disaster. But there was nothing that any of them could do. Divers were sent down to evaluate the situation. One man put his helmeted ear, ear against a vessel and listened for any sounds. When he heard the sound of someone tapping Morse code, because he knew Morse code, he could decipher the message, and it was this. Is there any hope? You know, the world's asking the same thing. In this age of evolutionary philosophy, when our schools and our media are proclaiming that there is no God, no meaning, no future, the world is hungry for hope. Hope. Not... Uh, wishy-washy hope, but a, conf a hope of a confident expectation. There's uh, a point here in which we have something in which we could hope, and that's Jesus Christ. I, I just want to share some stories with you from the, the Bible. Remember the story of Gideon? Uh, we meet Gideon in the book of Judges. He's hiding from the Midianites. They had just come and plundered uh, the nation of Israel, that right at harvest time they'd come in and steal all their crops and all their uh, stock. They'd just leave enough for them to be able to replant and get through the winter and, and all, and they'd steal as many animals as they could, and they'd go off. They were, they were just everywhere. And Gideon's afraid for his life, and he's hiding. And God came to him and said, hey, I'm going to make you a mighty man of valor. And Gideon had hope. And Gideon, 300 farmers with nothing in their hands but a trumpet and a pitcher and a, and a light, took on the vast Midian army. God gave him hope, a job for a real warrior. There's another couple in the Bible, an old couple. Their name is Abraham and Sarah. He's 100 and she's 90, and God tells him, hey, I'm going to make you the father of, uh, of multitudes of people. Now, I want to tell you something. There's just no way that's going to happen, but he gave Abraham hope. And lo and behold, when he was 100 years old, he had that little boy, and he called his name Isaac, and he became the far father of the great nation of Israel and of Islam. Also, he's talking, God gave hope to a lying trickster of a shepherd named Jacob. He gives him the title, changes his name after he's wrestled with him to Israel, the Prince of God. One that you may be more familiar with is one we find in the New Testament, a guy by the name of Peter. Peter was a fighter. Peter was a, a brawler, if you will. He was a fisherman. He was a seasoned, tough guy. Very little education. Jesus walks along and calls him, and he said, I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter. You will be the rock upon which I build my church. You know what? When you found Christ and accepted him as your personal savior, you got a new title. It's called saint. And what it means to be a saint is that you've been set apart as a holy vessel for the master's special purpose. The second thing in this uh, prayer is your worth. He says he talks about the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See what the riches are? It's not about gold and silver, but it's the saints. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that, hey, we are God's saints. Uh, we are special to him. We are an inheritance to him. Uh, God's not only given us an inheritance, eternal life, but he's made us a part of his inheritance. Uh, Paul is so excited about this, because here was a man that had it all, but in reality had nothing, 
who now became a child of the king. And he inherited everything that God had because he was the son of God. There's an old story told about uh, Johnny Wingo. He was a handsome bachelor, maybe the nicest looking guy in the village. And it was a village where the custom of, was of the day that a man, when he found somebody he wanted to marry, would get together a dowry and take it and negotiate with the father. Most girls went for three cows. If you were an exceptionally beautiful girl, you went for five cows. And so what happened is Johnny uh, uh, decided who he wanted to marry, and uh, he went out there looking for him, and, and he went to the father of a girl by the name of Soretta to negotiate a dowry. Tied, tongues began to immediately wag, for it was now known that Soretta was not a very pretty girl. In fact, she was kind of ugly. In fact, she uh, was plain and, and didn't have, a lot of people didn't think maybe she'd ever get married. On the other hand, Johnny Lingo was known for being such a sharp negotiator and such a good businessman. They speculated on how much he would pay for Soretta, maybe as low as just one cow. However, Johnny Lingo did nothing of the sort. He marched up to Soretta's father and offered him eight cows for her hand in marriage. Eight cows. It was unheard of. No one had ever paid such a high price for a bride and for such a plain woman as Soretta. But after the wedding, a strange thing happened. Soretta began to take on a noble bearing. Her head was held high, her eyes sparkled, she beamed with an inner glow. And in the years that followed, she became renowned as the most beautiful woman in all the village. People would come from near and far just to see her radiant grace, which had become legendary. One day, Johnny was asked, why had he paid such an exorbitant price for his woman and wife? He replied, I love Soretta and wanted to express the high value of our marriage. Her self-esteem had been greatly elevated as she realized that her dowry price was higher than any other woman in the village. Then with a grin, he added, the other reason I had was that I wanted to marry an eight cow wife. You know, God paid the highest price for you and me, not merely in cows, but his only begotten son. We have worth. And that makes us his prized possession. And we have an incredible value. Third thing you get from this prayer is your work. The Bible says it's a passing greatness of his power. There's now a power principle at work in my life. It is the same power that reached into the sealed tomb and made a dead man get up and walk. He hears the point. God has given us that power. That's what he's saying here. Same power that resurrected the son is the power that I give to you as one of my children. You know, it's impossible for you as a Christian to live this life. I think this is why so many Christians are frustrated because they're living this life outside the power of God. Do you ever feel powerless? Like you want to obey the Lord, but you're just not up to the task? Well, we ask for the second chance and Lord, here I am again. You know, you're just not quite meeting it up. I've tried to do good. I just can't do it. It's impossible. God's uh, just, where are you, God? I need you. I just seem like I just can't get my life going. I want to share with you a story in closing. Uh, in fire service, they state that the buildings God don't want to burn down, he sprinkled. One of the most tragic fires in the history of the country took place in a little town in Texas where a fire broke out in an unsprinkled school. And it took the lives of 263 children. There was scarcely a family in town that was not touched by this horrifying tragedy. The town went a number of years without school facilities. And it, but as it began to grow and expand, a new school was built and a brand new sprinkler system was added. Civic pride ran high and they got the uh, honor students of the school and dignitaries to give tours and they always would point up and say, we'd have a beautiful sprinkler system. We'll never have another school that burns down. And they never wanted to have that kind of a tragedy ever again. 
as the town grew and grew and got bigger and bigger, they had to add on to their school. And when they added the new wing, it was discovered that the sprinkler system had never been connected. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you connected? The Bible said he is the bread of life. He is the living water. In fact, he is the source of life. His resurrection power is available to you, but only if you're connected. It would be a shame today to leave here without being connected. It's simple enough to do. There's any number of us people here be more than glad to open the Bible and share with you how to be born again. We can just go right over to the next chapter that Dave talked about last week. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Wouldn't it be tragic? Wouldn't it be tragic to have missed heaven when you had an opportunity to meet him today? And receive all the things that Paul said, man, you got power. You got worth. You got value. All these things that God wants to bring into your life. Do you know what Paul said in just closing? That he he had reached a pinnacle of his faith as a Jewish Pharisee. He was the top guy. He was on his way to becoming the top guy, if you will. And uh, he had punched all the buttons and he had rung all the bells and he was on his way up. And then he met Jesus. And power came into his life. And when he looked back at his life and all of his accomplishments and all the things he had seen done in his life and all the accolades and the trophies that he had received, he said, I count them as lost, as dung, as worthless, of no value. And he said, what I'm looking for is the power of God in my life. Because he met Jesus on the street, on the road to Damascus. And began to see for the very first time. His life was changed. And we're changed because his life was changed. Today is the day of salvation. And I'm sure in a crowd of this size there will be people here that maybe aren't sure they're plugged into the power. But you can do that today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. And I pray for anybody here that's hearing this message that they don't know you, that they would come to know you. But Lord, there are lots of people. Our churches are filled with people that have never been plugged into the power. They've gone to church all their life. They've said all the right things. They've done all the right things, if you will. They've lived a good life, but they were never connected to the source of power. Today, Lord, I pray that they would become connected. And Father, for those that are connected, But for some reason, they never had realized that God had a plan for their life, just an incredible plan to bless them. And God's going to supply the power in their life to do incredible things. Lord, that you would speak to their hearts right now. And that they'd quit fooling around and wasting time, but they'd focus on the things that are eternal and focus on the most important things. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.